Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass Education Series, Fired Up. We are a leading resource for glass collectors, artists, galleries, museum personnel, educators, and anyone else who's interested in just keeping up with all things glass happening all around the world. We uh, provide a place for the glass community to have a robust conversation around glass art, its production, techniques, and trends, as well as providing exhibit grants and artist scholarships. Um, at its core, the mission of the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass is to further the development of and appreciation of art made from glass. So if you'd like to become a member and uh, get a little bit more involved in the glass community, please visit aacglass.org. Okay, now I'd like to get to our special guest today. We have Leah Wingfield coming to us from Oregon. Leah and her husband, Steve Clements, have a new sculptural series that they've created called Destination Unknown. And we're so excited to hear a little bit more about their practice. They're also going to take us on a live tour of their studio space and to show us uh, some of their sculptures in person. And if you have any questions as we go along, please put your questions in the chat and I will get to them when we're able. All right, please go ahead and take it away, Leah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen, right? And this took um, Demetra and I about three days to figure out, so wish me luck that I think we got it. Okay, good. Okay, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if you um, will see us, but Steve's gonna pop his head in and say hello. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, he's got a terrible cold, so he's gonna be the man of mystery today, but uh, he does exist. <laughs> <laughs> say hello, Steve. Hello, y'all. Welcome. And I'll be in the background if you have any questions or not. And I just don't want to spread a bunch of Zoom germs all over the world. So I'll back off a bit. <laughs> okay, so um, welcome to the studio. And, you know, thank you so much for coming and spending your time with us. Um, I have to tell you that uh, this has turned out to be an unusual serendipitous time for you to be here. Because in addition to being able to show you photography, um, it just so happens that there's a lot happening in the studio and I can't really think of a time when there's been sort of an example of everything that goes on in the studio for you to experience and see. So um, it also allows me to offer a couple of surprises um, for you. So. Stay till the end. <laughs> and I also um, wanted to mention that you will see that on the photography of the photographs, I've um, noted the titles of each piece so that if you have a particular question or interest, then you can just make a note and we will know what, which one you're asking about. So away we go. Um, today, I wanted to think about the a couple of things that we don't normally get to show or talk about which is the as i'm saying the alchemy of turning wax into glass the wax is not something you get to experience and it's of course where it all starts and for me is where i'm really doing all the work and so i wanted to give you this experience and then I'm also thinking about the alchemy of the weird seeds that start an idea. And so I'm going to give you some of those stories as well. So here we go. And so, as I said, it starts with the wax. And uh, Gertrude Stein said that in every masterpiece is a dose of ugliness. And that ugliness is the artist's attempt to say something new. And <clears throat> excuse me, you can see how that works. <laughs> 
And you know, the, the, the reason I work in wax is because I can take it directly into the glass mold. And the reason I do that is because I don't particularly like mold making. So I choose to just go from the wax original directly into the mold that will go into the kiln to cast the glass into. And that mold is plaster. Um, it's arguably a riskier way to do things because I'm not protecting the effort by making silicone, silicone molds and mother molds and storing them. And you know, if something happens, which inevitably something happens sometime, somewhere, someday, then you know it's uh, it's one and done. And so one of a kind is, is quite true here. And, uh, and certainly over the years, you know, disasters happen, but um, you know, we've been at it a long time and they happen less and less. And when they do happen, um, it's amazing how long it can take us to figure out what the problem was <laughs> because we've gotten a little, we've gotten so used to, doing what we do that sometimes we can have a hard time identifying the problem, but eventually we get to it. Um, when I'm working on the wax, this is where I'm having a conversation with myself. And the, this is where the piece is for me. It's not necessarily about me, but it certainly is what I'm thinking about. And I'm, at stages like now, worrying a lot about, oh my God, this looks terrible. Am I gonna be able to actually make it into something beautiful? I mean, am I gonna miss it on this one? And after you know, over 30 years of doing this, it happens on every piece that there's that question and that doubt that, oh, you know, I just might blow it on this one. And so, you know, you have to keep going. And so it's, it's where I'm having the conversation with myself. I'm enjoying it. This is what I really love to do is sculpt. And so I'm thinking a lot about technique um, in sculpting. I'm thinking a lot about is this going where I want it to go? And then I'm thinking about am I getting to the place where it's going to convey what I'm hoping it will convey. And most essentially, I'm trying to convey emotions. And it's a challenge. I find it a real challenge. Once I finally finish the wax, and they can take me forever. And part of that is just, I'm kind of, I'm a slow sculptor. Um, if I'm really enjoying it, I can languish and sort of take my time on it. Um, and at the point that I start getting really, really nitpicky is when Steve comes in and he, you know, says, stop it. <laughs> it's enough. And, um, and it's, uh, I heard painters um, say once that, uh, that a painting is never finished, it's just abandoned. And it's kind of the same thing. I mean, I could just work on these things forever. And um, <clears throat> part of it could be avoidance because then the next steps are not my favorite steps in getting to the glass. So, um, so I tend, but I, I spend a long time on the waxes. Um, I wish I could work this fast, but you know, what we're observing now takes days and weeks sometimes. And uh, this would be a dream to, to be able to work this fast. Um, so then, you know, as I'm, uh, preparing to finish the wax and then I start on the next phases of mold making, getting it into the kiln, thinking about the glass, that is the point at which I start the conversation with you. And I am starting to think about really, am I conveying the message I want to? And less than a message is can I do, am I starting a story that you will layer on top of? That's really my goal. 
And so now I'm starting to think about you, the audience, the collector, my friends. You, I used to think about my mom a lot. Will mom like it? And, and so that is then the moment where the reason to make it in glass becomes really important. And that is connection. That's how we connect and connect to you. And we make it in glass because we love glass. It's beautiful, obviously. That's why we're all here. And um, if I would tell you the truth, I would be perfectly happy to just make the wax stop and go on to the next wax and never see it in materialize into a more durable material. So my discipline has to be applied to finishing it into glass. And you know, what could be a better choice? Um, certainly these pieces could be in other materials, other castable materials, but I think glass adds so much to the finished item. But I also find the waxes really beautiful on their own. And um, I don't work for Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, so they're not durable. <laughs> and so putting them into glass is obviously the, the next best step. And that's where I'm hoping you start to add to the story. So now we start getting into some of our more recent series. And um, these title pages reveal just a moment of the weird seed that starts the idea. <laughs> and so with this um, one, one of the inspirations for this series, the codependent series, was a really sore foot that I had. And um, and so, you know, the story there is just quickly that it was COVID time and I was out mowing the field and I had a really sore foot. And so I was very frustrated. I was very grouchy. And I was also um, in the process of caring for my mom, helping her get to the finish line of life. And then we were stuck because of COVID and my foot hurt and I'm walking along and I watch my dog blue running right along in step with me and i think to myself oh my god i am so tethered that i i mean even my dog won't let me walk in a straight line and that began this thinking about tethers and being tethered and i realized that all the things i was feeling frustrated about were tethers of love and so as time progressed and I started to think about that and we got mom through the finish line and COVID started to let up. Um, this is where this series occurred and the significance of the dog comes from a few different places. Um, inspired directly by my mom who provided dogs for me in the, my entire life. She had dogs her entire life and at the end of her life, she couldn't have her own dog, but people knew how much she loved dogs. She was the dog lady of Jacksonville. And she would sit on her front porch and people would be bring their dogs to her so that they could sit in her lap and she could give them cookies. And it was really lovely. And I also had my dog with me while I was living with her at the end. And it was really important for him to be there, not, not just for him, but for me, and cer certainly for my mom. And so when I started to think of these pieces, I started to think of the dog as the stand-in for a very particular kind of love that we have. And it is such a, it's a, it's a particularly voluntary kind of love. And so I like to use the dog as the expression and the stand-in for our best selves and where we give all of this love to this creature. And it just shows us as being loving. And this is what I want to celebrate in these pieces. And um, the, 
the process of making these pieces was really beautiful too. I, I just can't even express how much I enjoyed making them, how much Steve and I um, loved seeing them develop. And then when we decided on what glass to use, we chose this opaque, warm white glass because for us, it felt, um, it just felt completely right because it pulls you in, it's warm, it's rich, and it really allows the shadows developed in the sculpture to define the features. And then combined with these beautiful warm woods, uh, we feel that they really, really um, express, all of this comes together to express the emotion that we're trying to get to in these pieces. And, um, and we just, I, I just, I just have to tell you how much we love these pieces. They're, they're so meaningful to us. I loved sculpting them so much. They were a great challenge. And, um, and the dogs, I mean, I, you know, one of the most, um, one of the best reactions I've had are tears. I've had several people start to cry when they see, see these pieces. And I, as an artist, I mean, that is one of the best compliments ever. And uh, so these, uh, the, you know, and the titles try to express the feelings that we have when we just melt into these dogs. Um, and when we melt into that feeling, that love, that emotion, um, it's, uh, it's just beautiful. This piece um, was sold in France, which I was really pleased about. And, uh, um, you know, how many times a day does my dog demand that I do this? A lot. <laughs> now this piece um, is in a very special place right now. Um, it was accepted into the exhibition, the Toyama exhibition in Japan. And, um, that was uh, very excited to be accepted in that. I think they had 750 applicants and they chose 60 um, for the um, exhibition, which will be in July. And it will be at the uh, Toyom, Toyom, Toyama Glass Museum. And, um, you know, what an honor to be included. And it's a beautiful, international exhibition and I encourage you to watch for it because um, it's featuring a lot of artists from countries that at least I haven't seen represented very often and so I'm really looking forward to um, seeing the exhibition and it will be um, it's live so the piece is, is going is in Japan and um, no news is good news where that is concerned after all the shipping and so it's there and uh, and uh, it's a, so it's a, it's a great honor to have sharing breath um, in Japan. Okay, next up, the storm series. And the question there was, um, how do I get air in the hair? And so what I would, what we were thinking about here is there's, I, I wanted to get, in these busts, I wanted to get more action in the hair. I, I love the hair, I think it's really expressive. But there is um, kind of a technical issue, which is it, get, it adds a lot of weight. And so as we all know, that's, a, that's an issue with glass because it's heavy. And so I have to be thinking about that as I'm making the wax because these are all solid. And, but I wanted more activity, I wanted to get some air in the hair. And so what we devised was inserting all of these shards of sheet glass into the wax and then casting the glass. We make the mold, we pour the mold around it, and then we cast the rest of the glass into that mold and it captures and inserts the, all the shards into the piece. And uh, it was, 
it was really interesting to do. It was incredibly tedious. I mean, there's just like hundreds of these shards in there. Mm -hmm. But we were, but we really enjoyed it. I mean, we took our time with it. We really enjoyed it, and we were really excited by the idea and um, excited by the results. And so, part of what we're considering here is they became about storms and they became about wind and wind for me is a recurring theme and is um, an important one for me it's an important metaphor for just about everything and it um for, for me the wind expresses um sort of the the challenge of dealing with unseen forces and it sets up um, the challenge of sometimes having to move against the wind, fight against the wind, the unseen force, the surprise challenge that's landed in life. Um, and you have to push against it and it makes things difficult. And it, you walk outside with a perfect hairdo. And the next thing you know, the wind comes up and you're stuck in it and it messes up your perfect hairdo. And then you just have to sort of get on with it. The other side of wind is that if you're in a boat, a sailboat, and you have no wind, all you wish for is more wind. And our experience here is that we have these wildfires all around us in the summer and the smoke drops in, and you don't want wind to whip the fire up. But then when the smoke drops in and it hangs, we're wishing for wind to blow it away. And I, I find that metaphor I think about a lot of times. It helps remind me that um, it you have to hang in there and you have to keep at it. And when your hair gets messed up, you have to just accept it sometimes, even though you have the perfect coiffure. And um, so these pieces were um, very interesting to work on and um, and they are all about resilience, which is another theme that I tend to be thinking about in my work. And even though you might be on an off kilter base, like on this piece and your hair is messed up, you don't give up, you know, you, you're a survivor. We're a survivor, I'm a survivor, Steve's a survivor. And, uh, and so these were um, started, at, you know, with that question in mind, how do I get air in the hair? This was a big one. Steve had to have so shoulder surgery. So now what? No woodworking, no Steve working for a while. So that led to the Wild Dreamers series. And I needed, so the, the technical difficulty here was that I, we wouldn't be able to make um, mixed media, essentially. We wouldn't be able to include wood bases or steel or you know the other things. And so we had to design from the point of view that it's only gonna be glass. And so, so I, we, I started to think about um, thinking dreaming. And these ladies came along um, to consider the freedom of the mind for, for wild dreaming. Why not? We use the key to um, express an open mind. We think of that. It's a symbol that we use often um, to think about having an open mind for wild dreaming. Um, here, I want to include the wax of some of some of these because, again, I like you to be able to experience a little bit of what I'm experiencing when I'm working on the wax, which is you have to imagine that this, you know, dense brown, rather shiny material is going to alchemically more met metamorphose into this material that's not at all like it. And so it's through experience, of course, but imagination that I have to be imagining how is this gonna work in glass the whole time. 
and imagining what kind of glass will I use and you know what what's going to happen there where is the light going to fall where do I have to block the light how will the details show up there's all of these things in, in consideration and I'm also at that time loving the wax thinking the wax is beautiful itself so I wanted to include the, the waxes so that you would have a little bit of that experience. You, you can now think and imagine in your mind what, what are the next steps? You know, how do we go from wax to glass? What glass might you see it in? Um, and again, you know, we have the key as the symbol for an open mind. And I just wanted these to be a little bit of a reminder to, to do, to dream and to open. And it's a reminder to myself really to just make sure I stay there. Um, and then as Steve started to heal and he was able to start working again, we felt like we wanted to get back to bases and I wanted to change the scale on these a little bit. And so we started to think about dreaming in a larger way and we wanted to suggest where some of this wild dreaming might come from. And so we decided to start using some of these um, books and then you'll see later some radios. Um, to suggest where dreams might have come from. And it occurred to me that as we moved through the, this series, that these items, books, and these old radios that we found that um, Steve, we found them sometimes still kind of working. And so Steve would take the guts out so that we didn't have to worry about electrocuting anybody. And, um, and I, it occurred to me that, you know, books and radios were some of the original social media. And at the time they were invented and unleashed upon the world, you know, the same hand wringing that is going on now around social media was happening around these items that now, you know, obviously are not only ubiquitous, but archaic. And, you know, we've moved, moved past radios to some extent. And I found that really interesting. When we would choose books, um, we looked for old books and um, we tried to choose books that um, referred to art, obviously, as you can see here, but we also chose travel books and we found some really great old travel books. And now these books have all been connected to each other and so you can't actually get inside of them. Um, but what we liked about those ideas is and, and put together here is that we we thought of the way books originally would bring the world to you and allow you to create dreams from that we thought about how art would re, would create and record ideas and events and bring those dreams to you we used the hourglass um, necklace as a reference to moving through time. You can time travel with these um, ideas and these items. And then we also would use the compass as a symbol for moving through time, distance, and for searching in your dreams and searching for your true north, I think is what we do. And um, these were very, again, you know, really great to work on, really interesting and um, opened up a little bit of a new scale for me. I really loved working at, at this scale and still love working at this scale. And, uh, and I moved through different scales. So um, that was one of the things that was exciting about these. And setting these busts on these items also um, was sort of, it was kind of a classic, almost interior design thing that I kept seeing and um, that often, you know, you'll see busts that are set on top of stacked objects or books. And it just kind of had this natural feeling to it to develop them like this. 
So now we come up to the most current series um, that we're introducing. And uh, here's another one that, you know, the weird seed for the inspiration. And, um, and it kind of literally is this feeling that I've just been having, you know, with all of the, I don't know, our, our own experiences in, in our life and kind of this uh, turmoil that I think we're all expressing and feeling right now, which is nothing new, really. I mean, I think back in life and I can't think when there hasn't been turmoil, but something about it is kind of slowing me down. And so I thought, uh, you know, I just feel like I'm dragging my feet. And what these pieces do for me is again, remind me about resilience and remind me about my own powers of resilience and that you don't give up. And so this one itty bitty boat is kind of where it started with, you know, here I am with this obviously ridiculously small boat and tiny oars and I can't rely on it. And so, you know, how am I gonna get there? Which is we get there by picking the damn thing up and dragging your feet through the water and getting your skirt wet. <laughs> and so, you know, that, and so it's, it's, uh, you know, that's where it starts. And what I'm trying to do with all of the work that we do is plant the seed of this story. And I don't want you to take my story home or our story home. I want it to be something that you can layer your story into. And when I'm making the waxes, I'm wondering, do you feel this too? Does this happen to you? Will this help you, you know, remember your resilience? Um, you know, it, it moves on to this, um, Peace vines, where she's being threatened by being engulfed in these vines. And you can just take a look at her hand and see that she's broken the vine and she's on her way out. And I want to mention this beautiful glass, particularly, which is this very interesting, tricky glass. It's a lavender shift, is what it's called. And it's got this amazing party trick where it changes from green to lavender throughout the piece as you move around it and where it's more thick, it's green. But the really crazy party trick is if you just put it under fluorescent light, it's entirely green. It's just fantastic. But we felt that this was a really good choice for this piece because it sort of grounds her in the earth, but then, um, as you move up and the lavender begins to happen, then she is blooming. And we thought it was just the perfect glass for, for this piece. So you decide that uh, you've had enough of all of this dragging your feet in the mud, and it's time to take flight. And um, she's kind of stepping off the cliff, which refers to taking risks. And you have a choice with that risk that, you know, you, you take flight or you fall. And taking risk is, uh, you know, it's, it's very important. We, you know, we're, we are in the risky glass biz. We're in the risky art biz. Um, I take a risk with the waxes um, because they're ephemeral. Um, I make all that work. I hope I've made the mold right. And then I melt them. And it... They don't exist anymore until they're glass. And hopefully the firing goes right and they become glass. And it's just a reminder that um, I'm a risk taker. Uh, we are risk takers. Life is full of risk. And um, there's a decision to, to be made to take flight. And I felt like this um, indigo glass was the perfect color for the moodiness of that idea and then it suggests the sky to me. Um, and then finally in this series is, uh, you don't have to go it alone, we're going together. And again, the dog just re represents companionship. Um, and this uh, has a nice story already to it, which is it's been sold 
to a couple who are making it a gift to their daughter. And what that means to me and what I love about that is it now um, contains the, the dog in particular in my mind contains the spirit of the parents and in this gift and that it will go together with their daughter for the rest of her life and their lives. And this is exactly what I'm hoping for. And now when it goes into her life, she and her parents add their stories on top of this idea. And that's really what I'm after, what we're after with all of our work is it just provides a scaffolding or a seed to add your story. And when people share their stories about pieces and their interpretations, it just completely enriches it for me. And we think that's important because if it were only about our story or a story I'm making up with the wax or that Steve and I have concocted, you know, we, it, it's very difficult because we can't explain it to you all the time because we're not standing next to the piece. And so we think very carefully about editing, editing, editing to bring it to a moment in time that resonates with you, that then you take it and it's your story. And that's what we're always hoping to achieve. Um, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but that's, that's always our goal. And I think we're all, familiar with this, but it never hurts to <laughs> remind ourselves that all this talk about inspiration is great, but we have to get in the studio and work, work, work. Fun fact about Chuck Close, I don't know if you know this, but um, he had this condition where he could not recognize faces, that faces were just objects to him, even his family, people he's, he knew, friends, and how interesting that he would choose to do portraits couple of reminders for the new ideas. The difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as escaping from old ones every day. I need to think about that. And then a person with a new idea is a crank until the idea succeeds, said Mark Twain. <laughs> this explains everything. If you have any questions, here's your answer. And collaboration finally is really what it's all about. And I started to think about that and the collaboration for Steve and I is obvious. Um, we've been at it for a very long time. Um, but then I began to realize that uh, we are also collaborating with material. Um, we have to figure out what, what will the wax do, what it won't do. Then we have to figure out how you work with plaster and collaborate with it and get it to agree with us or vice versa. And then we have to collaborate with heat and fire and you know try to get it to work with us. And then we have to collaborate with the glass and oh my God, the glass, what a taskmaster, right? We all know this. And then we have to collaborate with the rest of the world um, with um, the collectors with admirers with the shippers with and I just began to realize what an entire world of collaboration this is to just make you know one one thing <laughs> to sit on a pedestal and it made me more appreciative of that and of the effort and of everything that goes into it and all the people that are involved that we appreciate and so really, finally, it's all about collaboration. And I want to give this to you. We'll leave this up for the screen, which is our contact information. And um, I, you know, if you've got any particular interest in a piece, if you've got any particular questions, if you want um, more, you know, if you're interested in more of a studio tour, we're still going to move around a little bit you have our contact information and you can ba get back to me and we can get together more. Um, and so we'll leave this up on this screen. 
And at this point, I'm going to switch to the iPad and we're gonna go into the studio and, um, and then up to the house because I have some surprises for you because you are, um, you're here and you're here at a really great time, like I said, the serendipity of this time. And um, you get to be the first ones ever in the entire universe to see some new work. So before we do that, Leah, um, we just have a couple questions that I wanted to get to. Okay. Um, in terms of the new work that you were showing us, can you give us just kind of a general idea of the scale of those pieces? Yes. Let me go back to them. These are all 25, 26 inches tall. Okay. Yeah. And a question about the vines piece. How did you create the vines so that they were thick? So they were thick or weren't? Yeah, so that they they were thick. I guess they're wondering about the relief and um, I'm assuming that's part of the wax sculpting process. Yeah, you can see. So if you look to the right of it and you look at the wax, you can see exactly how the wax was sculpted. And so it's kind of... Um, would be closer to like a bas relief. You know, the the leaves are sculpted and applied to the the piece, the main the body of the piece. To the wax. To the wax. And um and then it's all cast as one piece. So what you see in the wax gets cast into the glass. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and just a quick question on the um, earlier series that you have, is the eye and lip color added after the casting? Yes, so in um, in these pieces um, and the Storm series, the, the dream, all the dreamers, this is all cast in clear glass and um, sandblasted, and then um, they're painted. Okay, great. And um, just a request to please show your contact info again before we get to the studio tour. We'll just leave this up. And so it should be available in the windows, right? Um, it really won't, it'll, um, I mean, it'll be available as a thumbnail. I don't, depending on the size of their monitor, they may or may not be able to read it, but um, I'll also go ahead and put it in the chat for you. And um, I also saw Aaron Shea somewhere in the chat chat saying that he could answer questions about the works as well. So I think um, they'll they'll be able to get a hold of you. Now, if we could have Howard, um, please go ahead and change the spotlight to Leah's iPad. Um, we're gonna take you on a live uh, studio tour and show you some brand new work. Dimitri, if we don't, get rid of the screen share it will be really small for everybody to see so there you go okay so i've stopped yeah. i've stopped that share and okay good let me just turn the you don't you don't need me here i'm not the the thing let me turn the okay all right so welcome into um the working part of the studio that was the office and what I have to share with you are live and in-person waxes, um, which, uh, uh, like I said, it's really unusual that we've got so many different things in the studio at one time. And I can't remember when it's happened before, and it's not likely to happen again. So, yay, good on you for being here. Obviously, one more of the dog series, the codependent series. And I think this is where you can get a sense of the intrinsic beauty of the wax itself, which I wouldn't normally think of as a beautiful material, but, um, but it's, I appreciate it more and more even after all these years of working in it. And this particular wax is, uh, is a sculpture wax and it is developed to be able to work like clay and carve. So I warm it up and then it's pliable like clay. And so I actually build these like clay. Then um, as it sets up, then it gets hard enough to for, for me to carve so I can work on it in both ways. And I, 
Oh, that was that was Steve saying hello. <laughs> um, and then um, I steam the wax out of the plaster mold and recover it on top of a bed of water that it's been uh, that it lands on. And so I've been reusing this wax for over 30 years. Um, now, this is um, a drum roll. These waxes are brand new, never been seen before. And it's a brand new series for this summer um, that I'm extremely excited about. And um, so far, we're calling the series Sky. And it's about launching. Um, again, freedom, release, dreaming, resilience, launching together. This one is about half finished. Um, there's still a lot of sculpting to do, a lot of details to get in. And then this one is about 95% finished. And I'm so thrilled with the movement that can happen with these pieces. They will, they're um, going to be solid glass and in color. And I can show you that it's actually a wedge shape. So we will get some beautiful um, variations in the colors, we hope. Now this one, I will tell you, is going to be red amber and which is, seems like an obvious choice to us as a very dramatic, passionate um, piece. So, uh, you know, it's exciting for me to be able to share these with you for the first time ever. And I'm hoping now that after a little exposure to the alchemy of turning wax into glass, you can um, imagine that transformation from this material to the future material. So we now what we're going to do, excuse me, Leah. We did mm -hmm. have a question regarding working with the wax. Um, you know, when you were showing us, for example, the video in the very beginning of your presentation where it was um, in a quite a malleable state and you were able to really move it around and sculpt it to being in a, a more rigid state where you could carve it. Can you talk about how the wax um, shifts between those different states? Um, well, I just warm it up. And so if you look behind and against the wall, you can see a wooden box there with a skull on top of it. Mm -hmm. And um, we refer to that as the easy bake oven. And Steve made that. Um, and all it is is a box and it's got a light bulb in it and some, Simple. and lined with um, aluminum foil. And, um, then the wax, um, once I recover it from the water, Steve, could you grab a piece of wax there? Once I recover it from the top of the water, then I clean it and I just pour it into kind of cookie sheets and then um, reuse it over and over. And so then I just cut it in those, these smaller sections, stick it in the easy bake oven and um, warm it up. And then I can squish it and um, work it any way that I want to. I can also um, carve it. So as you can see, it stays um, hard. Um, so if I need to do something from hard, then um, I can do that too. So it's very versatile. And uh, like I said, it's, it's most of this wax, um, I have to refresh it every now and then, but um, it was the original uh, wax um, that I bought over 30 years ago. Does that answer the question? It does, thank you. Great, okay, so now um, take a little walk with me through the garden and um, quickly, and then we'll go up to the house for our 
final little surprise that we have for you. And you can see that it's kind of an overcast day in Oregon. <laughs> oh, and um, my companion, Lou, say hello, Aww. is uh, always, um, always, always, always next to me. I call him my dog tumor. I'll just quickly show you um, this bronze sculpture that's in our garden that we made for ourselves many years ago. And into So what we have for you today is your own um, exclusive exhibition <laughs> of finished work that we have in the studio for a very short time. And including um, this framed tango drawing. And I'll just give you a quick overview. And then this is of course, the, work, the waxes that you just experienced, we have one in glass, and you are the first people in the universe to see this piece. So let me start over here, and I will give you a view of each of these pieces. And so here we are with codependence. This one is sneak attack from the back. And this one is um, being included in an online exhibition that Bullseye Glass will be um, having. This one is, I think it's Exhale, but I'd have to double check. I can never remember the titles very well, or at least not for very long. <laughs> Now you are getting to experience the Destination Unknown work. And this is cool because I can get in here and show you some of the details that, you know, it's hard to do in photography. And this is some, um, and just so this is just a little better than being, you know, than um, photography and not quite as good as being in person, but almost. And here she is walking through the water. This is vines. And this is an, um, this might help with that question about the application of the leaves. And so you can see that you get some color variation um, right in the leaves because of the places where they are, they've lifted, I, I've lifted them off of the main body of the wax. That's what that variation is, so that they are standing proud. And the, I can't quite get around, but the vine, let me see if I can get around here a little bit, a little awkward, but the vine does continue around the back. And we have take flight. You can see a little bit more of the detail in the cliff that she's stepping off of. And this beautiful indigo glass. And then we come to sky. And now you can go you can take your imagination from the waxes that you just saw right into the glass. And boy, are we excited about these pieces. I have to confess, we get excited about all the pieces, which is a good thing. But this is a very different form for us to be working in and I'm so thrilled about it because I 
wanted to, I've always tried to figure out how can I get them off the ground? And, you know, it's impossible to do something like this and have them balance on their tiny, tiny toe. And, and so um, I can share the inspiration for this as well, which is um, the, the show that we do in France each year in Biot is uh, we are given a theme. And the theme um, this year is unfocus. And I um, was just really kind of struggling with the, you know, making an idea because I was trying to figure out how to illustrate being unfocused or unfocused. And so then I just switched my thinking and thought, what if I unfocus my mind and see what idea do I have? And all of a sudden, th that idea, right, that you saw, this one, just popped into my head. And I was just so thrilled because it, all of a sudden I had solved this problem that I've been, you know, thinking about for 35 years. And it's like, oh, don't you just love getting older? You just get smarter and you have more ideas. Thank God. And then um, the ever popular, thank goodness, Tango series. And here is a framed drawing. And so the, so the other little surprise I have is that um, is an offer that um, all of this work, um, including the drawing, um, is available to you um, to, um, if you're interested, to buy right out of the studio just through the weekend, through Sunday, because then Monday we start shipping them around the world. And so if you have an interest, you can contact me. You can use that contact uh, information and contact me directly and we can work together um, until Monday. And, uh, and then it's all, um, all on its way to- Can you tell us where the work will be going? This piece will be going to France. Um, these, um, the Destination Unknown pieces are going to Habitat for the International. And, um, the, this piece will be available through Bullseye for, for their online exhibition. And this piece is a destination unknown <laughs> category. <laughs> and so, um, so that's uh, just a special little offer. Um, you know, boy, it's just so interesting for you to be here at this time with all of this to show you, I'm so excited. And, um, you know, we uh, we just couldn't be more appreciative of than than we are um, of having you here with us and your interest, your continuing interest, and um, you know we couldn't do it without you. It's all about collaboration. Thank you so much, Leah. This has been a real treat for everyone to see um, the work actually live and in person there, and to see the beautiful way that the glass shifts in the light. Um, with the shadows and the color gradients. It's really stunning. So congratulations on all of the new work. Um, a reminder that you can see this in person at the Habitat Invitational in the first week of May. And um, if you happen to be jetting off to France, you can also see her <laughs> brand new sculpture at uh, uh, Biot, I, get, I believe you said, um, where that yeah. will be on display. Yes. So um, Howard, if you want to go ahead and stop the spotlight. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone. This has been a real treat for us. Very special to see all of the new work that Leah is creating. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And then after that, if you'd like to stay on and ask Leah some of, uh, some more questions or just to say hello, you're welcome to do that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.